Hey everybody, Jerome Aldonado, and it's Wednesdays, and welcome to Real Talk on Real Estate. Um, thank you guys for your patience. Our Wi-Fi has been a little wonky the last few days, and so we have uh, Comcast working on that stuff for us, but we're live, and I'm excited to be live. And today, we're going to be talking about how to build a warehouse. Now, I'm not talking about out there and build a warehouse with a hammer, um, but we'll talk about construction components to build in a warehouse. But more so than the construction components on how to build a warehouse is how to build a warehouse to profit financially. So everything that we're going to be talking today is going to be less about construction and more about money. OK, now everybody says the money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Ladies and gentlemen, money and finances control our life. It's a misconception that people have had um, if, if sold to you guys your whole lives. If you guys have been growing up, I tell you guys, look, don't go after material things. Don't go after money because money is the root of all evil. Money doesn't buy happiness, um, you know, and they're right. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it sure does make life a lot easier. And so what we're going to talk about today is how to utilize warehouses to make your life easier financially. Now, everybody talks about multifamily and multifamily is great. We build it. We develop it. Um, we're buying land. We're building houses. But how do you take advantage of warehouse? How do you take advantage of the warehouse sector? What is a good business model if you're getting started to go out and start making money building warehouses? And so warehouses can be built multi a multitude of ways. Um, I had a student in my inner circle that came to me this past week and they said, um, Jerome, I'm building office. Build, I'm building an office complex. And I asked him how big it was going to be. Um, it was a modest 6,000 or thereabouts square foot office building. And I said, do you have tenants for it yet? He says, no. And I said, do you guys know who you're going to put in the building? He goes, oh, just local businesses here and there. And I sat back and his, as he was unfolding this business model for me, it just so much reminded me. I got like chills that ran up my spine because it's not good chills. Um, chills that ran up my spine because of what happened pre-2008 and where I, how I was building in 2008, moving into the uh, one of the largest financial collapses when Lehman Brothers collapsed in 2008, that <coughs> we had ever seen as a, as a nation, right? And it just it didn't just affect us as a nation; it affected us um, as a, it affected us worldwide. You know, so for those of you guys who think that we just got affected here locally, fresh squeezed juice, ladies and gentlemen, um, it affected it affected us worldwide. Um, there was economies all over the world that were affected by what happened in the United States in, in 2008. So how do we prevent that? Well, one of the things I mentioned to this gentleman, I said, hey, look, I said, when you're building this thing, I can teach you how to build it. I can teach you how to develop it. But at the end of the day, it's all about profitability. Like, how do you build a warehouse and make it profitable? And he wanted to just build office. And I said, look, office is great. There's a need for it. Um, but if you don't have tenants, one of the first sectors that got hit throughout the pandemic, the, one of the first sectors that got hit all the way through uh, the 2008 recession is retail and office. Now, office is, is on the move again. People are going back into office. But why not protect yourself? You know, go into a market sector that there's such an abundance of need for, like warehouse, that the chances of a compressed market affecting you goes down substantially. So like Jerome says, the, 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 the people will ask them, say, hey, Jerome, is there a guarantee that you'll give us that uh, if we buy land and build a house or I build a warehouse that the market's not going to fall apart? Well, shoot, I can't. I don't have a lucky little um, rabbit tail or I don't have a crystal ball to sit back and tell you guys, hey, this is exactly what's going to happen economically. But I can tell you based on history and I can tell you based on market needs how to build something that makes sense financially. OK, so that way, if we ever do get into a compressed market, you reduce your odds, you reduce the variables. So what you're doing is in life, there's only two guarantees that one, if you wake up tomorrow, you're going to wake up. And if you and you have if you, you're grateful enough to wake up with a heartbeat, you're going to have a problem. And so thank God every time you wake up, say thank you, God, for letting me have a problem. And one day we're, we all are moving towards an expiration. We just hope that that expiration date is as far as humanly possible. So is there a guarantee? No, there's no guarantees in life. But what there is, is a way to compress and decrease risk, compress, compress the risk, decrease it and increase probability, increase probability, increase the ability to generate capital. So look, there's over 1 billion. It's a real number, ladies and gentlemen. Statistically right now, we need over 1 billion square feet of warehouse space just to fulfill the current need of fulfillment centers, data centers, 
distribution, warehouses nationwide, okay? Now, if there's a billion square feet that are needed and they're having a tough time getting this stuff built because there's just not enough builders out there, the big guys. So you you take a look at um, at the big reaps, you know, you take a look like BlackRock and, um, and you take a look at what they've done. They've pulled $1.3 billion dollars out of their um, portfolio in refinanced revenue to be able to put as a down payment to go out and build um, they put $1.5 billion to go out and build, build $5 billion worth of warehouses. They're estimated to build half of the need 500. They want to build 500 million square feet of warehouses. Now, will they be successful at doing it? We'll see. You know, um, they have a good opportunity because they're backed by five, by large uh, institutional money. But how about for you guys? Um, where can you fit in to go out and build a warehouse? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what I told the gentleman that was part of our um, inner circle, I said, look, go in and do this model. OK, 6000 square feet. And so if you go in and you and you're going to have doors on here, 6000 square feet. Um, if you build each one of those out at 2000 square feet, two, four, six, what's well, only three units um, that you can build on that. Right. So. I think he had more. Actually, I think it was closer to like 10,000 square feet that he was building. Ladies and gentlemen, 10,000 square feet, it gets um, evaporated very quick when you're building. So let's say that you go in and you build um, five units. It's 10,000 square feet. Okay. So you go in. Okay. And these are all 2,000 square foot units. Okay. Now, what I love about building out warehouse is it's very inexpensive. One, the landscape, common space, all of that stuff, the requirements for it is very minimal. It's not like building an apartment complex where you have to have amenities and um, grass areas and just tons of different stuff, right? Um, another thing that I like about warehouses, when you actually build it, your cost to build is typically substantially less to build because you're putting up a framework of 10,000 square feet total, right? So you have a total of 10K square feet. Now, when you build that out, you're building a shell, you're building a roof, you're putting a foundation down. Now, sometimes if you're going to be having um, forklifts and um, a lot of equipment on there, the foundation has to be thicker than a traditional um, floor slab inside a retail center or inside an apartment building where it only has to be a four inch slab. You do usually have your uh, two foot deep footings around the perimeter or sometimes deeper depending on where you're building it. Now, when you're building a warehouse, you still have to do your footings. You might have to do a thicker slab, six inch, eight inch slab. But the difference is, is that you have substantially less mechanical, so heating and cooling, substantially less plumbing, and substantially less electrical work that needs to be um, facilitated within the warehouse space. So your build costs go down substantially. Now, if you go in, you have a 2,000 square foot unit. You guys ever went to like um, um, a lot of warehouses where they're more like office warehouse? So for a lot of people that are coming in, they want to know how to build warehouses. Here was my suggestion to the gentleman that was actually going to build office space and he was going to build out thousands, several thousands of square feet in office space. I sat back and said, look, that was the stuff when we had a compressed market in 2008. That was the first stuff to stay empty. Um, that was the stuff that, that we lost leases on and we had the hardest time fulfilling and getting filled with leases um, when, the, when the market got compressed. Um, when the eight, 2008 recession hit, I started opening up beauty salons to fill in office and retail buildings. I started buying subway stores to put in office and warehouse buildings because nobody else would lease from me. So I had a lease for myself. I had to create activity in my buildings. Now, I will tell you that most people don't have the ability financially or the willingness mentally and physically to do all that. Now, I was young. I was motivated. And I didn't want to lose any of my assets because that's what would have happened if I would have had to go through the duration of time waiting for people to fill my office building. So instead, I said, you know, no more. We're not going to do the office building no more. So I told the gentleman, I said, no, no, don't build the office. You can build it if you want. Just be forewarned that I sat back and I talked to you about doing something slightly different. What if instead you do office warehouse and you put a garage door right here? You put a garage door right here. Put a garage door right here, garage door right here, a garage door right here. And you did a loading bay. So you have a loading bay in front of all of these. Now, how do I know how to do this? I bought a warehouse that I actually landed up buying from um, Swanson Foods. 
leased it to Frito Lay, um, and it's been a home run since I leased it, and it's been about 13 years now, maybe 14. It's been a while. They paid for the building for me. We came in and did um, loading docks for their for their um, for their box trucks, and they could come in and just on those loading docks they can come in. Now it was a single tenant lease, it wasn't a huge building. It was about six five or six thousand square feet, and they use it for potato chip distribution all over the city. Um, and so it was a perfect little uh, setup for them. this is set up for independent use. So this is two thousand square feet. This is two thousand square feet. This is two thousand square feet. Two thousand square feet. Two thousand square feet. Now. You come in, you put in little doors right here. Little door right here, little door right here, little pedestrian door right here, and a little pedestrian door right here. You frame out a little office right here or a little retail area on every single one of these. Okay? You plumb them, and then right behind them, this retail area, you put in an ADA, you put in two ADA bathrooms, a men's and a women's. Okay, so you get a men's, a women's, 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 or you can just put a question mark on it and uh, and just use them for whatever, right? Or you can just do one restroom. And so it, it's up to you guys. Now, this is all office right here. So let's put an O for office, O for office, O for office, O for office, O for office. Now, what we do is we plumb these because you want to get the plumbing in the walls. Now, a lot of times if we haven't pre-leased the property, we won't even frame these out. We'll just have them plumbed in so that when we do lease them, we can frame them out. Now, if we don't lease it, if we lease it to somebody who needs more office space, then we can even go vertical with this too. Because typically warehouse buildings have ceiling heights of about 16 to 18 feet um, or higher. And so if you have 16 to 18 foot um, ceiling heights, you can do two floors um, that are... Uh, that are eight foot ceilings plus the trusses. So you'd have to go about 18 feet to be able to get a second floor in there. Um, or you can go a little higher. Now, I typically would build these out at about 20 feet, uh, 20 foot ceiling heights. Okay. So 20 foot ceiling heights. And this way you can, people with forklifts can come in, they can store stuff in layers and they can go vertical with it. Okay. Now, you could also go in and you go vertical with your office area. You could put the office area where people don't have to come in and deal with the retail customers up high. And then you can have the retail stuff down low. How many of you guys walked into like the plumbing supply houses, irrigation supply houses, lumber supply yards? Uh, they don't have these big, sophisticated uh, facilities. You ever walk into a mechanic shop? They have a small office and then everything else back here is all mechanic. People can drive in. They could put bays in there and drive in, put bays in there. They can drive in. They can do a lot of things that's happening even now is um, um, sports facilities are coming in. They're doing like indoor basketball, indoor gyms. And what we do is we have the engineers call out these walls for us, but we may only put in like maybe two of them. Well, we give them a sample. We put one here and maybe one like right here. And the reason that we do that is because we may land up leasing this all as one unit. Or we may land up leasing this all as like four of these as one unit. So instead of going through the cost of putting those walls in, we have it engineered, we have it spec'd out, we have everything ready to go to be able to build this out with the firewalls. But we want to get this perimeter up, and we have now the capabilities of having five tenants in there. And here's why. So the warehouse, ladies and gentlemen, has went up by over a 30%. The rents have went up by over 30% in just the last 20 months. And so warehouse is one of the largest increased um, sectors of real estate that's out there, even over multifamily. Multifamily has, been, has seen about an 18% growth rate over the last uh, 20 months. And, and warehouse has seen substantially more than that at 30%. So it's a great sector to be in. Okay. Now, if you go in, you lease this, I told them, look, put in a small office or just frame out the exterior, then start pre-leasing, right? Um, and most banks won't give you a loan until you have... Uh, two thirds of the property pre-leased anyways, unless you're an owner occupant, meaning that you're going to take up over 51% of the property. And then if you're an owner occupant taking over 51%, they'll allow you to go in based on the company financials to build this even with no tenants. But if you're not going to be an owner occupant and you're not going to be moving in to three of the five suites to be able to occupy two thirds of the building, then what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to go in and um, and pre-lease two thirds of it. You need to lease three of these units, and if two are still left vacant, 
no big deal. You can go in and get a bank loan on this, but I would still work on trying to lease these during the time that you're working on construction. Okay. Now um, the bank wants to see that because they want financial stability, because even if this, this building is built and there's no tenants, it's worthless to the bank because it's not income producing. The bank wants to see income producing real estate so that that way it has financial security to be able to pay interest back to, um, to their bank clients, right? That's how banks work. They're in the money business. It's a business, just like any other business out there. The banking business is a business. They lend money to get a return on their money, right? Whatever that return is, 4%, 2%, 8%, whatever that return is, that's the, the bank's financial um, interest. Now, so when you build these, you come in and if you're building a 10,000 square foot facility and you have 10,000 square feet going in, now, one thing that I look for when I'm building warehouses, um, when I, I, the way I like to build warehouses is I like free land. How many people in here? If you like free land, give me a thumbs up. If you love, love free, land, free land, give me a thumbs up. If you watch us on repeat and give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, you like the content that we're going over, click and subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. Follow us for, so that you're notified for more content just like this when uh, we we're producing it we produce this stuff every single week every single week whether it's how to buy land build houses how to buy land and buy warehouses or how to go out and get wealthy in a developing multifamily so ladies and gentlemen what i love doing is i love free land you know and if you like free land give me a thumbs up and let us know you love free land because what i'll do is i'll go in and i more so than the warehouse i want to know if there's land available on there to continue building so i want some producing so one of the things that I've done in the past when I go and look for warehouses, I look for warehouses that sit on a larger parcel of land, maybe so that they could store trailers, tractor trailers, the big semi truck trailers. But the building is smaller than what the city or municipality would allow to be built on that site. So for sake of example, 10,000 square feet, you're going to need right about one acre to build out 10,000 square feet. You could build out right around 6,000 square feet per acre. That'll give you the requirements that you're going to need for like handicap parking, parking spaces for employees and um, and then public works and parks and rec, all them get involved. So that you put like bike racks and pedestrian walkways and all that stuff that are required in any commercial development, any commercial development. OK, so with to fulfill the requirements that the, that the fire marshal's office to be able to get a fire truck in here and to get it to, to exit out correctly without them having to back up because firefighters hate to back up. They don't want to go into a facility and then back out into a roadway. That's a big no-no. They want to be able to come in, do a T-turn, and then come and pull back out forward. Okay? They'll back up to do a T-turn. You know, like maybe you have a, a truck that comes in, pulls forward, backs up right here, and then pulls out and rolls out, out the front. Okay? But you have to meet all those requirements. To meet all those requirements, you're going to be able to build out probably about 6,000 square feet per acre or thereabouts. So this 10,000 square feet, you're going to need about an acre of land, maybe just there, there shy of to be able to build this 10,000 feet out. Now, what if this building, what if there's a pre-existing warehouse that sits on two acres of land and it's, it's sitting where you could go in and you can build another building. So let's say this sits out here, but there's still more land available on this other side and you could simply add on to this or do a detached building um, off of this building. Now you can go in and build another 12,000 square feet of warehouse on free land. And so if you want to get financially secure on your property, the best way to do it is to be zero in on land and 100% in only on the build itself. And now you can go in, lease it, and your lease rates can even be a little bit lower to get tenants in, motivate them, poach some tenants from local uh, companies right down the road from you, give them one, two years of, of reasonable rent, and then slowly escalate their rent over the course of a five-year lease, and then get it to market value rent over the course of two, three years. That's what we'll do. I'll get in and I'll entice people. I'll entice business and say, hey, look, why don't you guys come in and lease from us? What are you currently paying right now in that piece of garbage building that you're in right down the road? My bar, my building, is, it was just renovated. We just put a storefront on this old building and we're getting ready to do a brand new build, a brand new facade of over 12,000 square feet. And so when we do that, it's going to be new construction, a lot prettier. We're going to fix the landscaping. And a lot of that stuff's already being facilitated at the same time. And so I go, now you get to get into a more desirable warehouse with better amenities, newer construction, less problems with roof, heating, cooling, all of that stuff. And you get to uh, do it at a, at a similar price to what you're currently paying now or a small margin higher than what you're currently paying. And so for those people that were leasing down the road from you and those folks were leasing for um, 
$6 a square foot. Maybe you charge them $7 a square foot to get them in the, in the lease. And then over the course of a couple of a couple of years, you escalate that up to nine, nine fifty a square foot. Now, warehouse space does lease for less money than retail, but it leases and there's always a need for it because these bays can get leased. Like I'll give you an example. One, I told you, I made mention to you guys the Frito Lays in one of our buildings. Okay, so we have Frito Lay in one of our properties. Um, we have um, a gentleman who has an industrial truck mechanic shop in another one of our warehouse buildings. And they do mechanic work like on big rigs, <coughs> semi trucks. They also do uh, mechanic work like on a lot of fire, fi fire engines and stuff. That's their primary business is actually um, fire engines. We have a Ford dealership um, that is actually a franchise Ford dealership that doesn't sell there, but they retrofit. It's for their fleet side of their business. They rent from us and they have a bunch of bays that they have lifts in here. And the brand new truck come in with no beds on the back and they custom build these beds for whatever fleet, for whatever company they want. So if they need dump beds, they put dump beds. If they're for like um, ambulances, they put the boxes for ambulances, put all the sirens and all that stuff on them. And they do it right there at one of our facilities. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so we have that lease. We also have an indoor volleyball um, facility that leases from us. The reason you don't want to put these partition walls up yet is because maybe the indoor volleyball place wants multiple, they need 4,000 square feet and they want to have like eight volleyball deals to do tournaments there. Well, we lease to an indoor volleyball place and we also lease to an indoor softball batting cage. Um, it's a women's softball um, team that practices there and they have an indoor batting cages and all that stuff. So all this stuff is stuff that, that we lease to. We have a, a roofing company that leases from us has uh, shingles and roofing material inside and they have, they park a few trucks outside and, um, and even a few trucks inside. So we have that type of stuff. Um, so warehouses, there's just an abundance of stuff you can do within the warehouse sector. And that's why I love them so much is that they're so multi-diverse as far as the tenants and the tenant types. And so financially it's great, right? So let's say for example, okay, now I didn't work out these numbers in advance. If I jack them all up, um, just know that the theoretical numbers, but I'm going to try my best not to jack them up for you guys. And I'm going to go off a national, the national average. Now, the national average nationwide was $6 a square foot. Okay. So if, if the rent rates went up, that was two years ago. Last time we were really hardcore buying warehouses. And now we're actually working on building them instead of buying them because it's just more cost effective to do so. And there's no inventory out there, ladies and gentlemen. So there's stuff like this, though. That's what I love is there's small stuff like this. So it's tough to find big warehouses because we're building like 100,000 square foot warehouses. That stuff is tough to find now, or it's extremely distressed in the, in the amount of money that it takes to go in and renovate it and get it up to par to today's standards for, to lease it is, um, it's better just to build it new in a lot of, in a lot of, um, in a lot of cases because of the building codes. And once we start doing renovations, we have to bring things to code. Once we bring things to code, the expense to, to purchase the property, renovate the property, bring it to code um, becomes extremely um, expensive on big, big buildings. Small buildings are typically grandfathered in and they're super simple. You don't need a lot. There's not a lot of requirements. In them. So you go buy a little building, renovate it and then build a new one right next to you. Free land, it's a home run. And so the new building, if it leases for $10 a square foot, let's say that we go in and we have 10,000 square feet times $10 a square foot, that property is going to bring us in $100,000 a year in revenue, okay? Okay, now, what I love most about um, where, industrial warehouse space is that Warehouses don't cost a lot to run. So if you're going in, you're doing a multifamily apartment complex, guess what? You're spending 40% on just maintaining that property because there's a lot of maintenance between swimming pools and grass and mowing and weeding and trimming and blowing and all the, all the stuff, toilets and light bulbs and all the stuff in apartments. About 40% of your gross income potential lands up going to, ma to maintenance. With warehouses, only 10 to 15%, depending on the warehouse, so if you have $100,000 in income potential on a small build like this times you're going to have about $10,000 in expenses to maintain that property each year, right? So you have about 10, 10K for main, to maintain it. 
Now, you're probably going to have about maybe 5K in property taxes on a small property like this. Each area is slightly different. 5K in property taxes. Okay, you guys can't see that, so I'm going to turn the page, right? Um, so we have $100,000 in income. Let's get it where you guys can see this. 10,000 square feet at $10 a square foot, and you're going to have $100,000 in annual revenue, right? Gross income potential. That's your gross, gross income, gross income potential, GIP. Let's see. Gross income potential, $100,000, okay? Now, expenses, you're going to have, um, an ex you're going to have your $10,000 to maintain it. Okay, now that's management fees if you're not managing it yourself. You can cut that down a little bit if you're managing that yourself. If you're managing the property yourself, $10,000, that's a lot. That's a lot to be able to maintain. Look, I have this property that I'm in right now. I bought this property in 2000. It's all block CMU. It's called, it stands for concrete masonry unit. So all these walls behind this are all cement concrete block walls. Okay, the whole building is built out of, of concrete block walls. I got a roof up on top. I've replaced it one time in 20 plus years. Now, so um, I, I, I've added nice heating and cooling systems to it. And we probably spent about $5,000 a year maintaining this. Now, we do um, the leasing on this property plus 11 others that we own locally. Now, out of those 11, we pay commissions out to our staff to lease it. But they're not leasing every single year. Once they're leased, we'll have a unit here and there that need to be filled. But most of them have long-term leases in them. So even 10%. Is, is a large number for a property like this, but let's call it 10% to maintain it, okay? Manage it, maintain it. And then you got 5K in property taxes. Okay, and then your insurance, you're probably gonna have about another 5K a year. And insurance. Okay, so you have a total of about $20,000 a year. So your, your net operating income, well, that's our gross income potential. Let's say that it's only 85% leased throughout the year. Okay, so we take $10,000, that's $85,000. But if we take $100,000 times 0.85, that's $85,000, okay? So $85,000 is our gross operating income. Now, what I charge is I charge what's called common area fees. So you see the building right here? How I get my income to go up from $85,000 before I get sidetracked here is I charge people what's called common area fees. What are common area so we're talking about maintenance and maintaining these buildings, right? So common area fees are what it takes to maintain the roof, the exterior facade of this building, the parking lot cleaning, and and, uh, and everything around it. Those are typically the owner's responsibilities. The, the walls, the exterior walls, the roof, and the parking lot. But even the parking lot, I actually charge the tenants for in a lot of, in a lot of times because they're the ones using it. They're the ones banging up curbs with their cars. They're the ones running over curbs, running over landscaping and so forth. And so I, we typically pay the water bill on behalf of the tenants, but we charge them back the water to the tenants and what's called a common area fee. We meter these separately. So they have to pay their own utilities, their own gas, their own electric. And then we, when, we, when we build them out, we also uh, tell them that we're going to include one cleaning a month for the site cleanup. If they want more, it's at their expense, right? And so... We do a standard once a month cleanup where the landscape company comes out, blows the parking lots, pulls any weeds coming up from the, the, the cracks and um, hauls and, tr and trashes everything um, once a month. OK, now, if they want it cleaned up more than that, then they we increase the common area fees uh, to allow to cover those expenses. OK, now, <clears throat> if something happens with the walls or the roof, we cover that. That's not a charge to the tenant. Um, Unless it's a single unit, it's a single tenant lease and we do a triple net lease, meaning that they have to take care of everything on the property, including property insurance, taxes, insurance, everything, right? 
a lot of these will do modified gross in a lot. And sometimes we'll even do these at triple net um, leases. But even in triple net leases, there's stuff that you're responsible for and they're responsible for. And I'm not going to get crazy about talking to you about leases and so, stuff like that today because that can get a lot more involved. And that's for a whole other video that we should probably record is, uh, is le different types of leases. So I'm going to write this down to my team that we should do a video on the different types of leases and what they're and what they do. Because if you guys are gonna build them, you gotta lease them, right? If you have a management company leasing them, they're gonna be talking to you these terms. Which don't you wanna know the terms that they're talking about? Like what is a triple net lease? What is a, a modified gross lease? You know, And so you wanna know that stuff so that you're a badass, right? You go in, you know this stuff, you know what, what the terminology is. But for all, um, for all intended purposes, the common area fees, cover expenses, on-site expenses related to the tenants. Trash service is another common area fee when you pay trash service, okay? I don't pay for the trash for the, for the tenants. That's an expense that they have to do business. So even out of this $85,000, we may add, tack on another $300 a month on everybody's rent um, for common area fees. So if you have five units, $300 times five units, it's $1,500 a month times 12 months, that's another $18,000 just on common area fees. So this number is arbitrarily lower, right? So we're we're sitting back and I'm going, okay, let's just go with worst case scenario so that that way any income above and beyond that just icings the cake. It just icings the cake and it's just more on top of that, okay? So $85,000 of gross operating income. You take $85,000 minus $20,000 that your, your net operating income, your NOI is gonna equal $65,000. Okay. Now you take uh, the price of this to build this. Okay. What are you paying for something like this? I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I love warehouses. Um, I'll go in and buy a building that's like this, like 10,000 square feet. And in, even in today's day and age, you'd be surprised what you can find. Um, you can go out and you can find a building like this for like 350, $400,000. Um, I just bought a warehouse. Um, it was a Krispy Kreme warehouse building that Ty and I actually bought together. Um, it wasn't a huge building. It was under 8,000 square feet, and we paid $250,000 for it. Now, it's going to be tougher to find that today, but we paid $250,000 for that building, and we leased the entire building for something like $4,000 a month, one tenant, easy, easy lease, no problems at all. So it's awesome, right? We have another warehouse right down the road, and we lease it to a brewing company, a grocery company that, that – that stuff that comes in and out. And then we use a big percentage of the company for a company called Farmer's Cart. And then we have um, some other small tenants that are in there that um, store ice cream and ice. someone that has an ice cream distribution company. Oh, and you know those big ice boxes, the ones that say ice on them with the big squares and it has the little, um, the, 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 the silly cartoon bear that's on, the, on those, uh, those igloo boxes or the big boxes that you open up, get your bags of ice, you go camping, throw them in your cooler. Um, we leased to one of those guys. They they distribute ice and they have those big coolers in there that say ice. It's cool. Every time I go in there, it reminds me of being a kid rolling up to Circle K or 7-Eleven. And um, those, they have that big box of ice sitting out front there. And I, I walk in there when, I, when I've been in town and there's just tons of those all over inside that warehouse. So really cool. All right. So I, I mentioned that because there's just so much opportunity in warehouses. I love it. Now we come in. And so if we come in and let's say to build it. Okay, what does it cost to build this? Let's say it costs us a hundred thousand. God, a hundred dollars a square foot is a lot of money to build this. That'd be a million dollars to build this out. Um, I would say you could do it for substantially less than that. But let's say it's even eighty-five um, dollars a square foot to build this out. So ten thousand, ten thousand square feet times. Um, let's just do it in a, um, let's do it at nine dollars a square feet times ninety dollars a square feet. That's nine hundred thousand dollars. So $900,000 and um, to build this out, okay? So you build this out, $900,000 is our price, right? Okay, so you take $65,000, divide that by $90,000 to get our, cap, uh, get our cap rate. Take $900,000, divide it by, and this is what we'll find out if we, if we need to raise our rents, right? If this, if it, because the rents will support it, but you have to make sure your business model. So times $700,000 divided by $65,000. Oops. 
oops, sorry, $65,000 divided by 900,000. 7.2% cap rate. So the way I did that is the way you figure out your cap rate is you, you go your NOI, make sure you can see this, NOI divided by price. Because your cap rate. Okay, so again, you take the nine hundred thousand dollars. I'm sorry. Take the sixty-five thousand dollars. I I always do that. I always want you, you. We're so conditioned, right? We're so programmed from school to go in and, and do the exact same things. You always you always divide by the smaller number, right? You divide into the larger number. Cap rate is different. You take your purchase price, divide it out by your. Uh, you take your NOI, divide it out by your purchase price. So sixty-five thousand dollars divided by. $900,000, that equals a 7.2% cap rate, 0 0.072, that's 7.2% cap rate, okay? I didn't get it up, I did not jack it up. So we got a 7.2%. And that's just doing a simple underwriting just out of the top of my head. A lot of times we'll sit down, we'll do these YouTube videos and I'll, I'll do the numbers in advance so that that way I don't jack it up for you guys. This one, I freelanced it. I just came in and said, look, because I know the industry. I know what it's going for. Um, um, two years ago, I would only be able to get about maybe $8 a square foot for the same building. But our building costs were lower, so it made sense. Now, it's our building costs are a little bit more. So even if we built out at $90 a square foot, it's going to cost us $900,000 to build that building. We're going to be $900,000 into it. We have a brand new building. And ladies and gentlemen, you go in. And, um, and you're making $65,000 a year on your net operating income, you have a 7.2% cap rate. So even after you service your debt, okay, so $900,000 times 80%, let's say they make you put 20% down, they'll probably make you put between 20, um, 20 and 30. So let's call it 25%. So $900,000 times 0.75. That's $675,000 on your note. So you multiply that times 4%. Your mortgage is going to cost you, your interest on your mortgage is going to cost you $27,000 a year. So you're going to roughly make just shy of $40,000 uh, a year in income. Okay. Now, most people go to work and they, they the average American makes $48,000 a year. And you're doing that on one small piece of property. Okay. If, if you have a mortgage. Now, if it's all paid off, your cap rate is 7.2%. Even if you have a mortgage, your cap rate is still 7.2%. Warehouses right now are selling for sub 4% sub four cap rates, meaning lower than 4% cap rates. So this building at a 4% cap rate is worth substantially more than $900,000. It's going to be someplace in the neighborhood of about $1.2 to $1.3 million is going to be the value. You have about three dollars $400,000 in equity on this deal, which is super cool. OK, and you're, you have cash flow coming in. So as that continues to rise, it continues to go up. The, the value is going to go up. You can do a cash out refinance, keep the property, get this to a 5 percent cap rate and still be in a real comfortable place to continue profiting, pull money out tax free. That's for a whole other video as well. Um, you know, so anyways, that's how you build warehouses, ladies and gentlemen. This is how I wasn't going to teach you guys how to go out there with a hammer and build a warehouse. You know, <clears throat> most of them are built with um, with block. CMU, concrete masonry units, and, um, and steel. That's what most warehouses are built out of. Uh, metal studs, steel, um, or block, concrete wall uh, warehouses. Very simple construction, very inexpensive, uh, but they're very profitable, very lucrative right now, and they rent. They rent. So if you're thinking of building an office building, do it, turn it into an office warehouse building. Your price per square foot on rent renting will go down, but your cost to build will go down, your liability will go down, your profitability will go up, and there's a need for it. So if we get into a compressed market where, um, where variables go against all of us, we don't have that crystal ball. You, you, there's no guarantees, like I mentioned in the beginning of this video. All there is is the ability to decrease your risk, decrease your risk, and increase your profitability. Decrease risk, increase profitability. That's what everything in real estate's about, is decreasing risk, underwriting for the worst case scenario. And if you if you underwrite for the worst case scenario, knowing that there is a need for over a billion square feet of warehouse and you just go in and be the little guy in a big market, you'll profit all day long. And ladies and gentlemen, that's how you go out and you build 
industrial warehouse space. Now, look, if you guys like the content that you guys saw in this video, click below, subscribe to our YouTube channel, give us a thumbs up, comment below, and um, somebody on my team, including myself, will go back to you at some point in time, sooner than later. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys. You guys go out, make it a great, uh, make it a great end to 2021. We're embarking on the footprint of 2022. So my question to you guys before we end this video is, what have you done now to set yourself up to prolay your life into 2022? Um, I don't do it on, an, on the end of the year, uh, physical year calendar. I have a life. I have, I have a life that I'm setting up, a lifestyle that I've been setting up since I was in my 20s. And so everything that I do, I do it continuously like a large corporation does it. Like Coca-Cola doesn't sit back and go, okay, it's the end of the year. I'm going to take two weeks off, three weeks off. Um, you know, we met our goals. No, they go out and they build for 15 years. You know, what am I doing over the next 10 years? What am I doing over the next 15 years? What are our projections? How are we going to get there? What's our business plan? Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the end of the year. And I'm telling you guys that right now, more than ever, <clears throat> is when most people start making a decision of what they're going to do next year. If you're one of them, change it. Start setting your 10-year goals. But ladies and gentlemen, building warehouses is a, great, is a great place to start. Buying land and building houses is a great place to start. Moving in that if you're already affluent financially, start investing in this stuff. Start investing in, in, um, in industrial house space. We got at least five to 10 years of opportunity here, ladies and gentlemen, and it's not going away anytime soon. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope that you guys had as fulfilling of a 2021 as I did. In spite of the pandemic, in spite of all the bullshit out there, we have had an incredible year. Real estate domination was amazing. Um, all, we, we put more on the, our books this year than we ever have in history. Um, our largest year that we had ever had prior to 2021 was $31 million of real estate on our books in one calendar year. We did $72 million. We were projected to do $55 million, ladies and gentlemen. We hit $72 million in 2021. $30 million of that's getting rolled over into 2022. And uh, we, have, we're, we already have a $58 million build on the books moving into two, that we're going to start off that we're not even accounting for in 2021. It's going to be on our books for 2022. We'll build it out in 2023. And um, we're going to have an incredible year. And so for those of you guys who want to join the movement, let us know. We're happy to work, teach you guys how to go out and do this stuff and uh, continue compounding your success, generating revenues, and uh, making 2022 as lucrative as you can. Many blessings to all of you guys, your families. Um, and uh, don't let the pandemic slow you down. I know a lot of people have been affected by it, so I'm not discounting um, those people that have lost loved ones. Um, 2020, uh, 20, 2019, 2020, 2021, very interesting years. But ladies and gentlemen, we're still moving. So continue moving into 2022. Go do some great things for you, your life, your family, and for your future. God bless you guys and go out and make it a great day and compound your success.